Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. On behalf of Alice and myself and Mark, I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we continue on, this is our third episode of this new new show, new, new program, new, new series. series. Yeah. It's going fast. Yes, it's a serious series about the Word of God. Uh, so we're going to pick up where we left off in our last program. And as we do, I want to remind you that you can write to us. I would uh, encourage you to write to us. Let us know where you're watching from at office at Bible talk.com. And at the end of the program, I'll give you a little more information about how to, how to get involved and participate in the show. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Brother Mark if you'll ask God's blessing upon our time together. Oh, Lord, God, I'm thankful that you're you. You're unique from all the other gods that people on earth worship. You came to help us. It's not by our works that we do anything. So in order to see that more clearly, it opened our eyes and our minds, our hearts and our spirits to see your word in this Bible study so we can spread it around. Amen. Amen. Well, as I said, we're, these are still early days in this program, and uh, we're talking about, we're starting out to, before we can search for Christianity, to really get a grasp of what it is. And that's basically what this is going to be a look at throughout the program, is how do you define Christianity? So we left off in a place last week where we need to start today. Christianity is about the imitation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay? Now, I want to make a distinction, an important distinction. Remember, the first revelation we have of the, the, the enemy, the devil, the serpent of old, is it says in Genesis that he was more crafty or more subtle than any other beast of the field. There's a subtle but very, very important difference between imitation and counterfeit. Mm -hmm. Okay? We are to imitate Jesus Christ. I think in our last broadcast I, that came out very, very clearly as we talked about what it means is to go back into the image, to be the image of Jesus Christ. Right. All right? Mm -hmm. We're to imitate Jesus to make him visible to the world. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians and he said, But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. We're to bring the knowledge, to bring the presence of Christ Jesus. But Lucifer, that enemy of old, desires to hide Jesus from the world in order to replace him. Mm -hmm. That's a counterfeit. Right. He boastfully <clears throat> proclaimed, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. That's in Isaiah 14. Now, the Random House Dictionary defines counterfeit as something made in imitation so as to be passed off fraudulently or deceptively as genuine. Not genuine, forged, pretended, or unreal. Okay? That's the distinction between a counterfeit, which is, which is deceptive, it's a fraud, and an imitation, which is to just be very much like. Why are we doing that? Why are we being like that? To, to exalt him. It's the motivation behind the action. It is. It's whether you, and I mean, Satan is a liar by nature and the father of lies, right? We have the example of John the Baptist. Now remember, John the Baptist, his ministry, he was called so as to make ready a people prepared for the coming of the Lord, right? That's what it says in Luke 1. And he said, speaking of Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. 
That's the humble attitude that we have to have. It's about humility. We began this series with an introduction that ended by talking about the humility of Jesus. Looking at uh, Philippians chapter 2, where it says, that, speaking of Jesus, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You can't get any more humble than that. Amen. So we're going to look at three things here now. We're going to look at talking, thinking, and reasoning. Okay? In the imitation of Jesus Christ. Uh, if I asked you right now, would you agree that you, you need to think before you speak? Well, I've asked that question many, many times now. And the answer is uniformly a resounding and rapid yes. To which I say, well, I think the Lord might not agree with you. Okay? I, we've been trained by the world. Until you were saved, until the day that you came to know Jesus Christ, you were being trained by the world in ways of an ungodliness, right? That's why now you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's why you have to be not conformed to the world. You have to be retrained, so to speak. The Apostle Paul in, in uh, 1 Corinthians said, When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. Well, now I want to talk about maturity, because you see, God is a God of good order. It's not without reason that the Holy Spirit moved the Apostle Paul to put things in this order. Speak like a child, think like a child, and reason like a child. And now we should speak like a mature man, think like a mature man, and reason. You know, it says in Proverbs 3, 5, or I'm sure you know, that we're to trust in the Lord with all of our heart, and not lean on our own understanding. Yes. It's not about figuring out what you should say out of your own understanding, right? We're not supposed to think what we're, you know, figure out what we should say before we speak. Listen to this verse. It's very logical and clear when you start to put Scripture together and be trained by Scripture. James says in his first letter, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear slow to speak, and slow to anger. If indeed this is about imitating Jesus, then consider what Jesus said when he said, For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. Mm -hmm. John twelve forty nine. We're not to think before we speak. We are to listen. We are to hear from the Lord before we speak. I said, because of the, the fact that the world has been training us since we were born to think before you speak, that's a difficult thing to overcome Absolutely. in the flesh. Absolutely it is. And that's, that's why, you know, we have to be transformed by the renewing. We have to take thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. It's a process mm -hmm. growing into spiritual maturity. It's that practice. Right? I said that when we, as we started this series... That a lot of this is going to come from Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And I believe that's the most beautiful, the most radical teaching ever. But before he spoke those words on the Mount that day, you know what he did the night before? It says in Luke, it was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. Jesus Christ, the Sermon on the Mount, is what he heard from the Father. Jesus heard before he spoke, and after hearing from the Father, he said, Not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. Okay? In real Christianity, prayer is not just talking to the Father, as we seem conditioned to believe today. It is talking with the Father. Jesus heard first what he spoke. And that should lead to us thinking like him. You see, hearing from God is supposed to change your thinking. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we too often demonstrate that we believe that us talking to him is supposed to change his thinking. Right. I mean, really, think about it. That's what, we try to convince how, much you, him. how much of your prayer life is you're trying to change God's thinking? Right. We, we try to convince him of our desires, right. not you yes. taking into account. Right. It's his desires we need to be doing. Our prayer life is about changing our thinking. 
You know, Alice and I, we do, we've spent a lot of time in, the, in over the last 10 years in the United Kingdom in ministry, spending a lot of time there. <laughs> and uh, I've had occasion to buy, like we last few times we've been over, we bought cars while we were there. We were there long enough to do that. And we kind of bought older cars because it was cheaper than renting. You know, we, we traveled all over the United Kingdom in ministry. So we ran across what's called an MOT in the United Kingdom. Now, M MOT comes from the Ministry of Transportation. Right. And it's a vehicle inspection, okay? It's an annual vehicle inspection that's required throughout the United Kingdom. Every year, everybody, you know, has to take, on the anniversary of their last MOT, has to take it and have it inspected to find out if there's any faults, if there's any problems, right? That's similar to many states in the United States. Yeah, have, have vehicle inspections, inspection, yes. Yeah. But this is nationwide in the right. United Kingdom. Exactly. And it is called an MOT. So a few years back, during one of our uh, extended stays in the UK, <coughs> as I say, I had purchased an older automobile, mm -hmm. and it was coming due for an MOT. Mm -hmm. And as the car was coming due for that, Alice and I were driving over to North Wales to partake in a conference there. And as I was speaking at that conference, it dawned on me, that's code for the Holy Spirit getting my attention, by the way, that as a vehicle was checked to make sure that everything was in proper working order, this conference that we were at was God's MOT. He had gather, gathered us, all of us believers, to modify our thinking. That was our. That was God's M-O-T, yeah. right? His purpose was and is to change us, to correct and grow us, to mature us, to transform and conform us. You know, David prayed and he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. That's Psalm 139, verse 20, 23. That's that inspection. That's that M-O-T. And we're not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, 2. Listen, listen now. From Romans 8, 29, he says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 3. See, it says in Isaiah, quite a few places, and in Jeremiah, that, that God is the potter. Yes. We're the clay, right? Just, that's what I was just thinking about. Yeah. Okay. He's still molding us and shaping us and changing us and how we seem to fight it so. The flesh likes comfort and resists change, and that leads to so many of the traditions that we have in the church, so many things that are done by a rote uh, that become the enemy of the Lord's purpose in our life. Now, I, I said this is going to be a very serious study, and I'll, I'll just remind you of Psalm 119, verse 165, which says that those who love thy law shall have great peace, and nothing shall offend them. As I say to you, how many times have you gone to your services, and it's three songs and announcements, pick up the collection, the pastor gets up and speaks, and then you have the greeting. Or, I mean, it's such a, it's, it's so predictable. predictable. Yes. Yeah. Now, I, I can't say that that's terrible, but I can tell you that God is very unpredictable. Yes. He has a tendency, if you know the word, He'll do, he'll do one thing. You know, one time he heals the, by, the blind by speaking a word. Another time he heals them by putting clay on his lips. Another time he heals the blind by sending them off to the pool of Siloam. He, he has, he's accomplishing the same purpose, but he uses different methods. You never know what the Holy Spirit's going to do. Mm. But you should be listening to him and be in tune with him because he is supposed to be in control, not our program. Those traditions can be weapons used by Satan who wants to bring us to a place where the Lord would say to us, then the Lord said, because his people draws near to me with their words and honor me with their lip service, 
but they remove their heart far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. Isaiah 29. Now referring to that very same verse, Jesus said to the Pharisees and scribes, Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. Mark 7, 8 and 9. But the Spirit cries out, like David, to be changed. Create me a clean heart. <clears throat> Create me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Psalm 51. After all, logically... If we're going to speak based on what we hear from the Lord, it will be based on our hearts being changed. Because just as Jesus said, for the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. That's right. As we start thinking differently, we will reason differently. Having different goals and desires and using his word to achieve them. And our great goal and desire while we are on this old planet should be to act differently like him. That's the whole deal, right? Absolutely. I mean, yes. and, and this is a problem. I mean, if you see Christians acting differently all over the world, then which one of them is Jesus? It says, do not give the devil an opportunity. Don't give the devil an opportunity. Okay. And I was thinking about the con uh, the counterfeits. When people counterfeit money, there are certain, you know, depending on their skill, there will be some counterfeits you can see right off the bat, and there's others that you, you couldn't tell. Well, well, what's hard is if you have a person that is not trying to be a counterfeit, trying to do God's will, and something happens and he goes off course, well, that's you not can't tell him from the counterfeit. Well, it's hard. Th this is one of the differences. I mean, we have to learn, you know, because we are supposed to judge those inside the church. Yes. And by their fruits. Well, yeah, but I mean, that's what it says. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and you'll see that. But there are false, there are false prophets, there are false apostles, mm -hmm. there are wolves in sheep's clothing, and there are brothers who are in error. Right, right. Now the distinction is, and this is where we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, yes, like sir, discernment, yes. is that a brother in error needs to be gently corrected. Yes. A wolf in sheep's clothing needs to be bashed in the head. Mm -hmm. Okay, sent out. You know, this is like God speaking to one of the churches in Revelation says, I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. We're not supposed to tolerate that. The word of God is precious. It's holy and pure. And, you know, it, it is that thing that guides our lives. We have to, we have to treat it as such. Um, you know, Jesus spoke, you're talking about the counterfeits and, and the real, about the wheat and the tares. Yes. And the tares, the problem was that the tares look from outward appearance, just like the, the wheat. But God searches the heart. Man may judge by outward appearance, but God searches the heart. And the time is coming when that separation will be made. And it's not until the end that that, that separation is going to be made by God Almighty. All right? But it's coming. All right, so if you're going to act like him, if we're going to be the real deal, if we want to find real Christianity and, and live that, think of this verse first. Because I, I, in the very first episode, we talked about the fact that Christianity is a commitment to Christ without, without concern for cost or consequence. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and said, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's what it says, all, all right? Now, I, I want to say something. You will never be persecuted by the world for what you believe. Okay. <laughs> Only for what you live. Mankind, saved or unsaved, cannot see your faith. They can only see the result of your faith, your confession, your actions. That's why James writes, and when he says, Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. But someone may well say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. James 
James 2, 17 and 18. Christianity is about acting on the Word. Let me tell you what I think. I, I think what you believe will control your choices. What you choose will determine your life. And what you believe comes from what you listen to. The Word or the world. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. That's what it says in Romans 10, right? Yes. But fear also comes by hearing. David said in Psalm 55, I am restless in my complaint and I am surely distracted because of the voice of the enemy. Fear and trembling come upon me. That's what happens when you listen to the enemy. And that's going to determine how you live, what you, how you act. But G James had said earlier in that, in that letter, he said, prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. James 1.20... Too. There's a lot of deluded Christians who think they're well, Listen, you think it's impossible for a, for a person who thinks that they're a Christian to be deluded? If so, go read the end of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said, Many will come to me on that day, saying, Lord, Lord, look what we did in your name. We did this in your name, we did that in your name. And he says, Depart from me, you evil ones, I never knew you. They were deluded, right? The Apostle Paul is absolutely in agreement with James. Because he says, for it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Jesus had the expectation that his disciples would do just that. When in the early days of his public ministry, he gathered these new believers to train them in righteousness before sending them out into the world. You got this? I mean, think about it. This is in the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Yeah, right? it is. Right? He starts his public ministry, goes and gets baptized by John. Then he goes out into the wilderness and he's tested. Mm -hmm. All right? Makes a brief stop at his request of his mother to go to Canaan for a wedding. But then he comes, and the first thing you see in the Gospel of Matthew, basically, is the Sermon on the Mount, right. where he gathers his disciples. Why? Because it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all Scripture is inspired by God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So the Sermon on the Mount is important because he has gathered, the, he's gathered his disciples. At that place, he names his apostles, mm -hmm. and he is preparing them to go out into the world to be the light of the world and the soul to the earth. That's right. But his word is what trains them in righteousness to be able to prepare to do that. Now let me say again, the Sermon on the Mount is the most radical, fanatical, life-changing sermon ever preached. It was like unlike anything that God's people had heard before. And it's all too rare for Christians to hear it today. So Jesus said repeatedly in that, You have heard it said, but I say to you. You heard it said, but I say to you, and he instructs them, and he instructs us today on how to live, how to act, how to love, in a way that would radically change lives. The Bible, in general, the Sermon on the Mount in particular, is a how-to-do-it manual, all about how to live. Yes. And I promise you that we will get into this, and you will see... If, if you have a heart to seek God, you will see that it is rare indeed to find the church acting as Jesus instructs in the Sermon on the Mount. When it comes to blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the meek, when he starts talking about forgiving. You know, I have the occasion, to, I've had the occasion over the last decades to do a lot of counseling. And I say some of the most dangerous stuff in the world or some of the most dangerous stuff in the Word, is in the Sermon on the Mount. That's right. I mean, when you think about Jesus saying, basically, the apostles come and they say, the disciples, how to, teach us how to pray. And one of the things he says when he says, okay, here's how you should pray. And when you pray, you should say to your Father, Father, don't forgive me any better than I forgive others. That's radical. That's radical. When Jesus said, you need to love your enemies, that's radical. How much do you see that in the church today? 
When Jesus said we're not to take thought for tomorrow, when we're not we're to turn our back on the cares of the world, because the cares of the world, as it says in Mark, when he talks about the, the this parable of the sower and the seed, and in Matthew, he says it's the cares of the world and the deceitful deceitfulness of riches that choke the word of God in people's lives. And yet that's exactly what Jesus speaks about in the Sermon on the Mount, when he says you can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve two masters. That's radical. Do you see that in the church today? Do you see that's the focus of teaching in the church today? Well, I, I don't. And, and again, that's the purpose of this particular study, is to get into the Word and say, okay, what is Christianity? You know, I'm not trying to judge what you do. I'm trying to find out what I'm supposed to be doing. And I, it, But it says, let a man examine himself. And I think the purpose of this is to try and stimulate that we would all examine ourselves and look at the Word of God and say, is this our life? Is this what we're living? The fact is, there have been so many studies done in the United States of America, which calls itself a quote-unquote Christian nation. And there is no biblical world view. Now, what that means is people aren't living according to the Word. That's right. Yeah. You know why? Because we have built up those traditions that I talked about. We have, we have built up this learning traditions by rote, where we set aside the commandments of God, clearly exposed in the Sermon on the Mount. If you want to know how Jesus thinks, go read the Sermon on the Mount. Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 5. Read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and you will see clearly how Jesus thinks and you will see how he expects you to No, how he demands. Yes, it's a command. It's yes. a command. How he commands you and I to think. I think the Sermon on the Mount should be something that we would read and meditate on every day, before we start the day, just to read through. Well, it, it truly is. I mean, remember that Paul said that all Scripture is God breathed yes. and profitable. Okay? But that should start our right. day. <laughs> no, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. There's, there's no part of Scripture that is not filled with, with God's breath and God's life, okay? But there are some things, I mean, the, the basic training. As I said, this was the first thing. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's almost like if you, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount as basic training for the disciples, mm -hmm. and then Paul's letter to the Romans as a commentary on that, okay? Oh, that's right. And, and the book of Acts on, okay, here's how we live this. It could be an outline, so you'd fill everything else well, in. Well, it, it really, to a great degree, it is. Mm -hmm. It really is. Absolutely. You know, it, so when do we get to this place that this is the desire, the burning desire of our heart is to seek the approval of God mm -hmm. and not the approval of man? Because yeah. that's what it really boils down to. Absolutely. Because the fact of the matter is, and I said this in the very first episode, we're to imitate Jesus who is the rock of offense over which men stumble. Don't think that imitating Jesus is going to make the world love you and want to come up and hug you and give you awards. It will not. But that doesn't matter. You want to hear those words at the end of the day. When all is said and done, when you come face to face with Jesus Christ, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Oh, Hallelujah. Indeed. Well, I, that pretty much runs out of time for, for this episode. So I just want to pray, Lord, that you, that you would use us, that you would quicken your word in our lives. And Lord, that you would use us for the glory of your name. That the word that's planted would bloom and blossom and bear fruit in our lives for the glory of your name. Well, until next time, God bless and goodbye. We'll see you then. Far away, stood an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners